and we could not ignore uh, artificial intelligence. And so we figured it was a natural outgrowth of some of the previous topics we've spoken about. Um, normally, and so we have great uh, two, two speakers today. We don't normally have our own firm. Like I, I'm, 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 so just so you know, I'm an I'm a, I'm a intellectual property and patent attorney at Gerhard Law. I'm going to let the speakers introduce themselves. Uh, the first one is uh, my partner at the firm. Uh, his name is James Klobuchar. You also know our third partner. You may know our third partner, Richard Gerhardt, but James is also a partner. And so I'll let James introduce himself and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. Yeah, thanks, David. <clears throat> um, as David said, my name is James Klobuchar. I am a partner here at Gerhardt Law. I've been with the firm for over 10 years now. Uh, my background is in biochemistry, uh, molecular biology, and chemistry. Um, and that phone call here. Um, but, uh, you know, I've been involved in all aspects of, of IP law from, you know, procurement of trademarks, patents, copyrights, all the way to enforcement of the same uh, via litigation. And, you know, I'm excited to be here today. As David said, um, you know, this isn't something that we normally do. And it is a, a hot topic that's really been pushed to the forefront here as of late, uh, you know, via chat B GPT and some of these other uh, AI tools that have, uh, you know, really gone viral over the last, uh, you know, several months, you know, or so. So, um, yeah, that's me, David. Did I leave out? No, I think you're good. Well, if, if you did, we'll cover it later. Thank you, James. <laughs> of course. Um, Stephen Friedman, our newest addition to uh, Gerhard Law. Maybe tell a little bit uh, everybody about you and uh, and and your and and your journey that ended up here. Yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah. Thank you, David. Yeah. Like you said, I'm I'm Stephen Friedman. I uh, I recently graduated law school. Um, and I took uh, I took the bar over the summer. I'm waiting for the results of that. So cross your fingers. Uh, <laughs> but no, I've been I've been working here uh, with Gearheart for pretty much my whole law school career the past past three or so years. Um, yeah, and it's been going super well. I've, I have a lot of experience in, in trademarks and copyrights, and that's that's what I've been handling for them. Um, you know, everything from kind of like James said, applications and prosecution in the offices and enforce like the whole the whole gambit. So I'm very excited to talk about AI and how it's affecting trademarks and copyrights in the field. And, you know, especially coming right from law school, it is like right at the forefront of academia. Everyone that is in this field is talking about how this is going to be affecting the law and like kind of kind of where this is going and what the ideas are. So super excited to be talking. Amazing. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, James. Let's just get right into it. And 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 I know there are definitely people here that know a little bit more than other people about artificial intelligence. But for those of you that don't know nothing about it, um, and there were a few of you, and that's we're, we're glad you're here. Maybe we can start there. You know, James and Stephen. First, James, maybe see. Maybe we can just talk about like what is it? Like what are we talking about today? Are we talking about like you know robots from like Westworld or, or you know uh, the, the the Terminator? Like what's going on with uh, artificial intelligence and 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 kind of why we're here? Maybe maybe one day, David. I I may not I might may not make it to see it unless uh, AI makes some longevity uh, improvements. But uh, fingers crossed, right? Yeah. Um, but Wait, hang on one second. Uh, okay, sorry. Go for it. Sorry, go for it. Sorry, sorry. No, I was just gonna say it's just the kind of the most basic, uh, you know, definition from from my perspective is that you know artificial intelligence or AI is really the intelligence of you know machines and software, you know, as opposed to you know traditional you know human intelligence. And you know, today I think we'll talk about you know, chat GPT and some other, you know, generative and, and, and creative type tools. But, you know, don't forget that, um, you know, AI has been around for, for a while. You know, the, the term, I think, you know, was probably coined in the, in the 1950s and has been around in academia, you know, since then. Uh, it's always been somewhat of a, 
of a sci-fi type topic, right? You see it in the sci-fi movies with, with you know, kind of David said, the Terminator and, and that sort of thing going back, you know, decades. And it's really been pushed to the forefront here as of late, you know, over the last several months. But but outside of, you know, chat GPT and, and, and the rise of those types of tools, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're using AI type systems or systems driven by AI, you know, almost daily, you know, Google searching, you know, is going to implement uh, AI. Um, you're going to have, um, you know, your Siri or your Alexa, right? Those, those in terms of, you know, understanding human speech implements it, um, self-driving, you know, cars, um, you know, people even, you know, create artificial intelligence uh, as it relates to um, creating, you know, chess bots, bots to play, you know, games and that sort of thing. So, I mean, it's something that people really encounter um, all throughout, you know, society and daily life nowadays, even if it's not something that you're, you're cognitively, you know, thinking of. Um, social media, too. Even if that you have something to add. Yeah, to I was going to add, like, social media, everything you're seeing um, on your feed, what, what your Facebook or Instagram yeah. is trying to telling you to show you the ads you see, all of that is driven by, uh, data that AI takes about your consumption habits, things you view on the internet and it, and it, uh, it spits out ads that it thinks, you know, you're going to like. Um, so it's really, it's really everywhere. Yeah. Agree. And Steven, can you talk about maybe some of the, just some of the, um, maybe more popular or, or, or it doesn't have to be so popular kind of tools that, that are out there for, for, for AI. Yeah. Like, so, so it's one thing to get, you know, a feed on TikTok or Instagram because you, you know, every day you're looking at like, you know, puppies and then all of a sudden there's just puppy, you know, feeds coming to you all the time, but that's not really, that's not, that's not, so that's not necessarily a tool, right. For someone to use. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, like we said, it 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 is all the way out there and kind of now, the past few years, it's become a tool that pretty much anyone can go online and find a website that does this kind of thing. You could give it a prompt and and see what it spits out. I mean, a lot of people right now, they're using it, um, I mean, like people were talking about earlier, they're using it to write bios or people are using it to write resumes. Um, people are using it to to draw draw images or create artwork. Um, you know, there's, I mean, the, probably the most popular one that people know of is chat GPT that, that will, you know, you give it a prompt and it gives you some information. People are using it to write papers in college. It's crazy. Um, uh, I think it just passed the bar, even chat GPT. I'm not sure I heard about that, which is insane. Um, but there's more, there's, there's ones that create images. There's ones that will do a whole thing for you. So, you know, it's, it's really crazy. So you can go out there and find an AI tool online for free that will that really will help you with kind of any task you're looking for. Yeah, and 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 are they all for free? I mean, no. Some of them you pay for them, um, but there are plenty of them online. ChatGPT is free. You just go in, you make a little account, and and you could use it for free. I'm going to show you one later uh, that generates images that is also free. Um, but then obviously there are paid ones. There are private companies that are developing more sophisticated AIs that have specific tools and, and uses for in different fields. And, you know, you, you'll probably have to pay for those. So, um, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of all over. You could do, uh, you could do anything with it. You could utilize it in a lot of different ways. There are people developing tools that you could use and for sale for free, just on the internet, everything. Yeah. And so that kind of brings us why we're here. You know, at the end of the day, we are uh, intellectual property attorneys. Many of you have uh, uh, even in your own introductions have talked about uh, the intellectual property that you're creating, uh, whether you're inventing something or you're kind of branding something or you're creating something like that's copyrightable, like a blog or something like that. And so that's uh, one of the first major topics we'll talk about is how it's affecting um, intellectual property laws around the world. Um, so we'll start a little bit with patents. Um, maybe James, you can talk a little, you can start with like, you know, not what is a patent, but like, like 
what is like the definition of an inventor, right? If, and and I think I think if we start there, and actually you can start wherever you want, but like I think if we start there, then we'll kind of bridge the gap as to you know uh, uh, whether artificial intelligence is an inventor of something. Yeah, so that's kind of what I'm trying to get to. Right, and you know that's that's a a good topic. I mean, the the definitions in terms of you know what is an author or excuse me, what's an inventor on on a patent or what's an author for you know a copyright, for example, um, are are pretty specific, right? And and they do require that it is you know a human inventor at the end of the day. There's been uh, instances within the U.S. and and abroad. Uh, where, you know, individuals have tried to challenge, you know, that statutory framework, uh, but have been unsuccessful, you know, in doing so, you know, at least, at least thus far to date, you know, there's arguments, uh, you know, that go both ways. Um, you know, people say, well, at the end of the day, you know, the inventor or the the author is still giving the AI tool the prompt. And so in a roundabout way, they're still the creator, but, you know, that hasn't uh, held water, you know, so far. I think um, as we continue to progress, it's going to continually, you know, blur the line and, and, you know, as things may progress, you know, legally speaking, there may be some recognition in some way, shape or form um, but all of that is is really speculative at, at this point. And even to, you know, draw on another example, which isn't necessarily an, an AI example, but just to show, you know, how how you know stark these these definitions are. Um, many people may remember what was you know referred to as as the monkey selfie going back a few years, where an individual's camera was taken by a monkey. The monkey took a, a selfie with the camera. Um, and ultimately, you know, there was a debate of whether, you know, the guy set up the camera and enabled the monkey to take it and, and had everything set up in, in a way that would make him the author or whether it was the copyright or the photo was owned, you know, by the monkey, but the monkey wasn't a person. Um, and so you can see where these types of, you know, scenarios come in. But at the end of the day, the, the long and short of it is, you know, it has to be a natural person uh, at this point in time, whether that'll change, um, you know, stands to be seen. Great. And, and so, um, so, so, so if an inventor has to be a human, um, what's your take on, because we've had this situation before. As you can imagine, um, everybody's using it for every sort of reason. And one of the biggest things that's happening from our perspective as you know, patent attorneys is people asking chat GPT to, as an example, using chat, I don't want to pick on chat GPT, but using, using some sort of artificial intelligence program to write the patent application, right? To make the inventor uh, the actual artificial intelligence. Um, now, granted, as, as J James just said, it has to be a human, but, you know, there, there are situations where, you know, potential clients or clients will come in and, and, and hand us an application as if they were the inventor when, when, when really they weren't. And that's, that's, that's a, that's a big issue that's about to likely blow up. And, you know, we, we as patent attorneys have to kind of keep our eye on that. But James, what, what's your what's your kind of thoughts on like, you know, using AI to write a patent application, knowing full well that it has to be a human, right? We get it. Everybody understands it. But, you know, people will always try to, you know, do something a little, uh, a little out of the box, underhanded, nefarious, whatever you want to call it. What's your what, what, what's your take on using AI to draft a patent application? I mean, certainly, I think it can be a a tool to you know provide someone with a start. You know, particularly if that individual is not um, you know well versed in you know preparing an application. But again, in in no means, I think it's you know a substitute for in quote you know the the real thing, right? Um, you know, at the end of the day. 
when you're creating something and, and I can show a, a couple examples here because I've, I've generated a couple different things to kind of illustrate, you know, yeah, what your um, host, James. you can, you can share your oh, screen. With me too. You're excellent. Yeah. Let me, I'll do that in, in, in just a second and sure. to kind of visualize, but we do get that a lot and, and, and people and David didn't want to pick on chat GBT, but that's normally what people say when they come to us, they say, Oh, do you use chat GBT in your career or, Oh, I made this via, you know, chat GPT. Can I file this? Um, you know, so that's, those are the types of inquiries that we do, we, we do get. And, you know, chat GPT is, is good, you know, at many things. I think when we were going through introductions, people talked about setting, setting alarms and scheduling reminders and um, generating, you know, certain types of content. Um, so that's something that, you know, it, it can be very good and helpful at, I think, you know, where its limitations come in um, a lot of times is that, uh, you know, the vast majority of people who have, have count, encountered it now that it's become, you know, kind of this viral trend is that they, they don't fully understand what it is and how it works and, and, and what the limitations are. You know, they think that it's just something that can just, you can just send it out and it'll do without understanding that there are, are very many practical um, and um, potentially potentially costly limitations um, on the system. Um, I don't know if Stephen wants to to comment on anything quickly while I uh, I've got a million windows open, so I just want to shift some things around so I can share a couple couple examples here. Yeah, no, I mean, David, you're on mute. I don't know if you're talking. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry if you wanted to comment on anything. I mean. I... You know, no, I, on the patent side, you know, James is really handling it. like it's uh, it's a tough one. You have to kind of really be aware of what you're doing. You have to be careful with it because, you know, like we're going to show you, there are a lot of pitfalls you could fall into if you're using if you're using AI kind of blindly uh, versus kind of using it really mindfully, knowing its shortcomings um, and knowing the limitations that it has as far as what you're what you're using it for. You know, you have to kind of really be careful. It is very useful in a lot of ways, but in a lot of ways you have to kind of add your own kind of human common sense to it right now. Cause you know, it is at the end of the day, a machine that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't think like us as of yet, uh, you know, <laughs> we'll see how far they get, but, uh, you know, it, right now it, you have to use it together, together with both a kind of human thinking and artificial intelligence. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the best way that that's right. I think the best way that I think that we that 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 I kind of understand it and kind of see it how it practically plays out. You might be able to get you might be able to use uh, um, uh, ChatGPT or AI to write a patent application for you, but that's not what a patent application is supposed to do. It, but there's more to a patent application. Specifically, it's a persuasive document to show that your invention is novel over prior inventions. And that's the element that you really right now need a human being for, you need a patent attorney for. Um, it's not It's not smart, as smart as it is, it's not that smart, right? It doesn't really, it can't really identify yet how your you have a novelty, which is what you need to prove in order to get a patent application in anywhere in the world, that it doesn't really know what your points of novelty are and how to correctly describe it. And, you know, which is, which is what you have to do when you, when you're filing a patent application has to be this technical document. So um, I think James has some examples of that. James, you let us know when you're ready, if you need more yeah, time. Yeah, I can, I, I can pull this up here. Give me one second okay. to um, share my screen. We'll illustrate what we just said. Just so you have an idea. And so I'll explain what this is. And, and, and before I do that, what you'll find is if you attempt to query, you know, a chat GPT or, or another comparable system or app, <clears throat> um, particularly with chat GPT, is that at the at the end of you know the prompt, if you're asking it to generate a patent application or or some portion of a patent application, whether it be a, a specification or claims, it does end up giving you a disclaimer at the end of the generated comment that basically says, "Well, it's a simple. This is a simplified example, um, and that actual claims may need to be you know more precisely tailored uh, to meet specific requirements." 
um, of the invention that cons essentially consultation with a patent attorney is, is highly recommended. And so what I've done here and, and what you can see hopefully now all on the screen is that, you know, I found uh, a patent that's been long since issued and expired uh, going back a number of years. Um, it's, it's patent number 5,490,437. It's directed to a hammer. Uh, the hammer had a, a you know, gelatinous material, as it's uh, described, having shock dissipa dissipation properties in it, um, essentially to, you know, make it so that uh, it's more comfortable, you know, to use um, at the end of the day. And and so I, you know, requested that, you know, ChatGBT essentially create its own claim based on the content of, of the patent, right, of that same patent. Um, and you can see, you know, what it, what it spit out, you know, next to it in the left-hand column, with the right-hand column being the, the issued claim. And, you know, the language is not identical, but similar. I've attempted to line up the portions of the claim that match, and the gaps in the chart, you know, illustrate for you where a particular limitation or, or feature of the claim, if you will, is missing from, from one side or the other, right? And so, you know, you can note, first of all, that, that the claim that was generated by ChatGBT includes, you know, a couple different uh, limitations, you know, main, namely at the top and the bottom that, that weren't found in the issued patent claim, right? And the reason that that is important is because for patent infringement purposes, that is, in order to have patent infringement, uh, a hypothetical infringer needs to meet all of the limitations of the claims. And so, you know, here, if you have, you know, limitation one, two, three, four, five, and six, someone has to have all of those. Now, if you're looking over here, um, granted, there's one missing, which, you know, it gives us an, an essentially an, an extra limitation. Right. And so in the other claim that's been generated, there's seven. Right. So now it's harder, ostensibly, uh, you know, to meet those limitations from an infringement purpose. A couple other things I'll highlight and point out is that you'll find that the, the language is perhaps fairly simplistic as compared uh, to the corresponding limitations. For example, if you take the second line here, you'll see that the chat GPT said, well, we have a handle comprising a plastic molded handle. Um, what eventually was what is, is the allowed claim in the other patent is an elongated handle having a longitudinally extending axis and a predetermined length L1. Now, though the differences in there um, can be described, you know, potentially for various reasons, but, but they are important um, at the end of the day. And so where something like this, you'd say, well, this is actually a little broader. Maybe that helps me. Then what you'll find, you know, down toward the bottom here in uh, in E, is that they describe that the end cap is secured to the end of the handle by sonic welding, um, and that sonic welding limitation is a very specific, uh, you know, description of methodology that you'll find is not, from my from my opinion, really necessary nor is it uh, present in, in the issued claim. And, and, you know, at that point, if anyone's sticking an end cap on by a method other than you know, sonic welding, then they ostensibly don't infringe the claim, right? I mean, it could be a simple friction fit and, you know, that would take, that would remove the claim, you know, from infringement. And so, again, you know, looking at these two, two claims here, you can see uh, at a very high level, they, they have similarities. But at the end of the day, as, as David, you know, referred to, what ChatGPT is, is it's, it, it's a language model and it's intended to interact with the user and it, it bases its responses off, off the training material. Um, it's not going to, you know, think or analyze or consider, you know, the limitations or the concepts that you as an inventor, you know, should be concerned about. It's going to just run through, you know, how it's been trained and it's going to, you know, spit out what it believes to be, you know, an appropriate response.
uh, moral of the story, James, <laughs> for all those listening? I mean, moral moral of the story is, you know, if if you need if you need a start to something, and you say, hey, I, I gotta I gotta figure out a roadmap, and I want to get something down on paper. Yeah, I mean, you 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 can do it, right? I mean, you can see the claim that it it produced. Um, at the end of the day, should you rely on it for legal purposes? You know, no, right? I mean, that's 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 the short of it. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, James. We'll come back to a little bit uh, to patents. Let's. Uh switch gears to uh, trademarks and copyright. James, you might have to make Stephen host. A lot of people are using uh, chat, so the other forms of intellectual property. A lot of people, and we'll get to your, by the way, if you have questions, put them in the chat. We'll get to them later, I promise. Um, but a lot of people are also using uh, AI to uh, create uh, creative content, uh, which uh, creative artistic con content, which falls into the intellectual property bucket of copyright as well as uh, creating um, uh, brands and logos, uh, which is also kind of creative content, but for the sole purposes of selling a product or service, i.e., which falls into the bucket of intellectual property called trademarks. And so um, we want to just kind of want you to know what's going on in those fields as well, um, especially after hearing some of your introductions. And Stephen will give us a little uh, insight into kind of what's happening there. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, so yeah, like like David said, copyrights are enforceable rights in artwork. And that can be, you know, visual art like a painting, or it can be literary art like a book, or it can be a movie, even software can be copyrighted now as kind of the the text you write. Um, and so a lot of people's first idea when AI became readily available is can I use this to create art? Can I use this to make a painting? Can I use this to write? A book? Can I use this to write my college paper? Um, and, you know, obviously a lot of people have questions like, is this art in the first place? I don't know. Uh, I'm not a philosopher. I don't have to answer that question. Uh, I am a lawyer though. So the qu our question is when AI creates art, is that copyrightable? Can we protect that? Um, can a person, uh, you know, put a prompt into an AI, get, get a photo out of it, and put that on the internet and say if you if you want to use that photo that my AI created, you have to pay me for a license. Can someone do that? Um, I mean, the short answer is no, but we'll get there. Uh, so what I wanted to do is kind of do a little bit of a demo of like how that works and how easy it is for someone to just kind of do that. Uh, so let me share my screen. Uh, yeah, hopefully everyone can see that. So this is. Uh, the Bing image creator. Uh, anyone can do this. You just go onto Bing, or I think you have to use the Microsoft Edge Internet Explorer. That's how they kind of uh, rope you into it. Uh, but you go on Microsoft Edge, you type in Bing image creator, and you'll get this website. You make an account, and anyone can do this. Um, and you just put in any prompt, and it'll kind of spit something out. These are like all the examples it gives. Um, and so I did a bunch of prompts just to kind of illustrate the idea, huh? illustrate. Um, and if anyone has an idea for a prompt, shout something out and, you know, we'll type it in and see, see what it spits out. But here are a few that I came up with. This is a sketch of birds singing and it's pretty neat. You know, it kind of, it takes the sketch style and it gives you that, um, you know, there are a bunch more I did. Uh, this is painting of a forest at night. And, you know, you can see it's, it's kind of artsy, you know, if I, as like kind of the casual observer, doesn't know anything about art. If I saw this, I, I don't know that I would know this was created by an AI. Um, this is my favorite gorilla wearing Hawaiian shirt. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, it has a lot of a lot of creative things. Um, yeah, does anyone have a prop they want me to well, spell in? I, I, see, I see somebody's, yeah, there's a few things, micro photography of a living cell. Can you put that in? Would something come up with that? You could just copy it from the- Micro photography of a living or, cell. I'm sorry. Micro photograph of a living cell. Micro photograph of a living cell. Create. Yep. It takes uh, 10, 15 seconds, uh, but we'll see what comes up. Oh, yeah. I can't see the chat right now while I'm sharing the screen. Yeah. So, yeah, if someone okay. put it in the chat, let me know. I'll, I'll let you know. There's also another one after that. Can you ask it look to at create that. a... Wow. Look at that. That's pretty. Actually. I don't know what a micro photograph is, but it seems like it. Uh, <laughs> uh -huh. Probably a photo under a microscope. Right. Uh, yeah, that would what make about, sense. Can you, can you ask it to create a meme? 
just mean. Yeah, like I, I guess I guess you need you, I, so Lisa. That's the point. Let's try meme. See what happens. You probably need to be a little bit more specific. The more specific you get, the more it's going to give you something that you're looking for, right? If I just type in yeah. meme, I don't I don't really know what's going to come up. But you know, the more specific you get, like this, I typed in rock star playing for crowd of squirrels, and this <laughs> and like this is what it'll give you. You know, that's I, so. This is oh, this here's is a meme. This is meme. <laughs> so I guess it takes those kinds of you know those general meme faces and it. And it creates something that you know seems like yeah that could be a meme. Uh, There's one last one from Alan. I love it. Can you get? Can you create a new logo for Gearheart Law? Uh I don't know if we will do that. That's, that's good. <laughs> that so is good. this is getting I into. I I have a bunch of uh, uh logo kind of concepts that we'll get into when I talk about trademarks. Yeah. Um. But this will this will show show you kind of some of the problems that I think huh. exist in the AI. So yeah, I mean, it's kind of interesting. It has the kind of general, uh, it has the, the like collect kind of the law balance kind of symbol that you'll find when someone talks about law. But when you try and put in words into this thing, it does not, it does not know uh, how to do that. It'll give you back gibberish. <laughs> um, and there, I have more examples of that when we get into trademarks, but it's pretty interesting. Um, Wait, so Stephen, so, so like to, just a follow-up question, you're probably gonna get to it. So here we are, with like so so Richard Alpert just asked for a, a, a kind of micro photograph of a living cell. Yeah, he gets it. Um, he's clearly not the author of it, right? He wasn't the creator of it. So like can what, can he can he try to protect it? Can he yeah. that's it right that's, that's the logical next question a lawyer would ask is can I take this and and protect it? And uh, I mean, short answer is no. I don't want to somewhere in the waiting room. Short answer is no. Uh, but let me tell you, let me show you kind of with a little story. Uh, this is Zarya of the Dawn. Uh, it's a comic book written by this, this woman, Christina Kashtanova. Um, and she wrote kind of all the text to the comic book. And then she put the text in an AI called Mid Journey and said, can you draw all the images for this comic? And this is what she got. And the AI just kind of spit this all out at her with all the images, all the images are AI created. And so she goes to the copyright office and tries to copyright the whole comic book. And they didn't know that the AI did all the drawings. And so they gave her a copyright. Um, and then she celebrates on social media. Look at this, I got a copyright with an AI. Um, and the copyright office sees it and they take it away. Uh, they say, uh, you know, you didn't tell us that you use the AI to do all the drawings of this copyright. And kind of like we were talking about earlier, the author of a copyright needs to be a human. You know, there was that monkey case where the monkey took, takes a photo, uh, takes a selfie of himself, and then PETA sued on behalf of the monkey to say, oh, this monkey owns a copyright. Um, but copyright authors need to be human. And so they took away a portion of her copyright for the art, and they left her the text portion of the copyright. Um, so, I mean, long story short, uh, that that is what it is. The copyright office earlier this year they released the whole rule set for what you should do, um, and basically when you apply for a copyright, you have to tell the copyright office I used AI to create this portion of the work, and this portion I edited, this, et cetera, et cetera. And as long as you're truthful with the copyright office, they'll give you a copyright for the portions that are human created or touched by humans. And so, you know, the kind of next question is what what can I do with this as an entrepreneur, as a as a business owner? What are the kind of best practices here? What can I what can I use AI for and how is this useful? Um, I mean, like people were saying earlier in the chat, people are using it to create like bios for themselves um, or for their companies or write copy on their website. And so kind of like our advice would be, you can use it, certainly, you can use it, but whatever the AI spits out right back at you, that's not gonna be copyrightable. What you want to do is to use it for either as an idea or a starting point, and then put your own spin on it or something like that. You know, if you get, if you get art spit out at you as a, from, the, from the AI and you want to use that art in your blog post or your, you know, your advertising or something like that, you prop don't use the exact art, maybe edit it a bunch or use it as an idea and draw something yourself that looks kind of like it 
uh, because that was the idea you got. That stuff is going to be copyrightable. The stuff that the AI gives right back at you, not copyrightable. And yeah, I, Stephen, if I may, I just want to just interject for a second and, yeah, and, go. Just, and just let people know that um, that if if you do decide to use it, right? If you do decide to use exactly what was spitted out against you, just know that you do not have yeah. the, you don't have the you don't have the federal right. A copyright attached to it, and, yeah. and 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 let's face it, we we all there's a lot of like cute people out there that are looking to you know like oh nobody's ever gonna know right oh I'm just gonna do what this woman did and I'm not gonna publicize it and like I, I'm gonna get my copyright. But let's face it, if you're gonna go after someone for infringement, and this happens on the patent side too, this happens everywhere. Like people are like you 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 don't want to hide any of the story behind your invention or copyright because if you're going to sue on that you're going to enforce it against someone the person that you're going to force it against the person you're going to accuse of infringement the first thing that they're going to do is not be like oh yeah i did it right i'm sorry the first thing they're going to do is try to prove that your copyright was invalid and it probably wouldn't be so hard to find out that the image that you are claiming as your copyright in this hypothetical was actually not created by you and thus you do not own the registration again yeah. in this hypothetical where you're going to be cute so you know i think yeah. i think i think steven gives some really good you know tips of like you know use it as an inspiration and then and, and then yeah and there might be some limitations there as well but at least at least maybe you'll have your hands on some sort of protection yeah no not to mention lying to the copyright office right. when you wind yeah. up with a fine uh, exactly. That's its own it's a federal issue. Offense. Correct. A federal offense to lie to the government. You sign a declaration or your attorney sign it on behalf of you that you are that you are that all the statements in your application are true and under perjury of law. So, um, yeah, not something you probably want to play with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there was uh, the only other thing I wanted to touch on on copyrights uh, was that uh, someone mentioned in the chat. Recently, there was this whole Authors Guild, a bunch of book authors kind of teamed up together, and they're suing OpenAI for its use of their work. Um, basically, if you don't know, AI takes kind of everything from the internet, and it trains itself on that. You know, if you ask it to write you a story in the style of Dr. Seuss, it knows that because it took, it took a bunch of Dr. Seuss stories from the internet, and it trained itself knowing what that looks like. And so a bunch of authors have come together, and they said, listen... If your AI is using our books to train itself, we should be getting licensing fees for that. Um, that's that's copyright infringement. And, you know, in a way, they're right. Obviously, the law is still very, very murky here. Uh, and we don't know what the result of that lawsuit is going to be. Um, but it's I mean, that's pretty much that's the forefront of uh, of copyright law right now is figuring out what what that is. Is AI going to have to uh, license that stuff? And, you know, as an entrepreneur or an artist, if you have something out there and AI, AI is ostensibly scrolling the entire internet, you know? So if you have something out there that AI is being trained on, you're going to want, you're going to want AI to lose this case because, you know, they might have to wind up paying you licensing fees to train themselves on your content. Um, and so, you know, it's a very interesting case, you know, I'd I mean, recommend. Steven, Steven I, I want, you don't see the chat, but uh, Peter wants oh, to yeah. know what is, well, what is your guess on the result of, 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 of such a lawsuit like that? Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, it's really, it's really new ground. I think technically, technically it seems like infringement to me because they are, AI is reproducing the work in their, in their system and they're using it. And then probably they're using it for monetary gain after the fact. So it seems like yeah. infringement to me, but you know, this case is gonna, this is, this is gonna go up there, up there uh, in the courts. And it might take a few, a few years at least before we get an answer or who knows, maybe Congress is going to say something. Uh, you know, <laughs> we, don't, yeah, we know I, how long Congress takes to say things, but it, you know, exactly. You know, I, I don't, you know, Peter, I, my, 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 my guess on it is, is, is in line with Stephen. I would say that, um, and James, I'm curious what you think, but, you know, from my perspective, nothing's really changed. If you have, if you have put something out as a copyrighted work, you get to control what happens to it. You get to control whether somebody copies it, displays it, performs it, you know, distributes it, um, takes a piece of it and makes a derivative work as we go. You get to control all of that. 
And so even today, when people take down images from, you know, the internet because they think it's okay because they just did a search and they took it down, we know that that's not the case, right? You'll get a cease and desist letter from Reuters or, you know, or, 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 or anybody, right, that owns that image. And so how you use it is might be the determining factor, right? Is it fair use or something like that? But from my perspective, if, if authors are putting stuff out there and AI is scraping it and then using it to some other, for other reason, and again, what that reason is will determine, to me, that's the, that, that, that is copyright infringement. Yes, I understand we have to balance technology with our changing society and all that kind of stuff. But I don't think it would be that far-fetched to have a company like OpenAI to, you know, pony up some, you know, royalties to the actual uh, uh, copyright owners that they're scraping from. But that's just my opinion. James, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I'm inclined to agree that on the face of it, you know, it, it appears to have the potential to be, you know, copyright infringement. I think the... Um, Kind of the wild cards, you know, some of these are are open source, you know, systems and, and, and others are not. And so in, in some instances, you know, these these cases are, are are in their infancy and it's not clear exactly, you know, what is being done and how by the AI platform that will have a determinative factor, you know, and it's very likely that um, you know, the the owners or the operators of the, the AI platforms or the AI apps uh, are gonna argue fair use, which is a uh, pretty big kind of gray area. It's a bit of a black hole in copyright law to some extent because there's no real mechanical test for it one way or the other. Um, and it's a balancing test of, of factors. And, you know, so like I say, on its face, it, it looks like it can be copyright infringement. Um, whether it will, will largely come down to, I think, exactly, you know, what what the AI platform or app is, is doing and how it's doing it, how they're training, you know, the, 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 the app. And then, you know, two, you know, this, this piece of, of fair use, assuming that that is indeed, you know, the route that these all go and how that plays out, you know, before the court. You know, um, different courts have different views and, and tests on that. So forum can make make a difference in that sort of thing. So it'll be interesting, as um, Stephen kind of alluded to. It's a uh, bit of a it'll be a bit of a landmark decision. It's 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 new territory that's being blazed. So it's always interesting to see uh, where the chips fall in those sorts of you know situations. Awesome. Yeah, Stephen, please continue. <laughs> All right. So move on to trademarks, I guess. Sounds good. All right. So trademarks, uh, kind of like we talked about, a trademark is a brand name or a logo, anything that identifies a product with who is producing that product, who is selling that product, something like that. Um, and so again, AI, you could use that in a lot of ways. For trademarks, the kind of classic idea is, can I use an AI to make up my new logo for my new company? Can I use it to name my new company? Um, and so I have some more, some more examples. Hold on, let me go back. Um, so starting with logos, I asked it to do a bunch of things. Um, you know, I gave it plumbing company logo, and this is this is what it spits out. I mean, it's pretty, it's a little generic. You know, it's a pipe with some water. Uh, you know, that's pretty basic. Watch company logo. All this kind of all this kind of stuff, um, and so as trademark attorneys, our next question is, you know, how safe is it to just ask an AI for a logo or a name and just use it? You know what I mean? Um, because obviously, trademark infringement occurs, and if you're using, if you just come up with a logo and you're using it, someone might come at you and say, "Hey, that's my logo. Hey, that's my name. I was using it first. You have to stop and." pay me for all the customers you've been uh, siphoning off my business. Um, and of course, the danger with AI is that it trains itself on what is already out there. And so naturally, your idea, the idea is if it's training itself on what's out there, then it is, it is kind of, it's probably stealing someone's logo out there. And it's going to be similar to something, you know, so we, you know, for a plumbing company logo, I looked up 
uh, just like a basic trademark search for plumbing company logos. And you see, uh, shocker, a lot of plumbing companies use faucets and sinks and water in their logos. Um, and, you know, a lot of this stuff, you know, might might wind up being uh, being infringing if you if you just try and spit something out. You know, I have another one. I did Internet company logo and it gives you something pretty generic, like one of these like little globe symbols. Um, and, you know, I did another search for Internet and kind of right at the top, you already see one globe, uh, the globe. It actually it looks like exactly the same almost as this one, you know, so. You know, it, it is it is dangerous to just take what AI uses. This one looks like Firefox to me with the little red tail. Um, it is dangerous to kind of go and just take that stuff and use it right away. And that's, uh, you know, that's what we're here for is to kind of when someone has an idea for a logo without AI, we take it and we search, you know, the various trademark databases and all that stuff to make sure that no one else is using that logo and you won't run into an infringement problem. Um, and so, you know, if AI is training itself on the internet, it is, it is probably more likely to do that kind of stuff. Um, that's just logos. I did one through chat GPT, uh, to come up with names too. I asked it for names for my new soda company. Um, and it gives me this whole list. Again, it's pretty, they're pretty generic names. You know, it's kind of just adjective noun in, in one, uh, in one word as a soda company. And it's, you know, it's stuff that is very soda-y, fizz, pop, quench. And then again, I looked up soda companies that use fizz, soda companies that use pop, soda companies that use quench. I mean, there's a lot of them. So whenever you're using AI to come up with a name, to come up with a logo, be extra safe, you know, ask an attorney to do a search, do a search, uh, find out if it's available. They even tell you, chat GBT right at the bottom, check for trademark ability and domain name availability before finalizing your choice. I asked chat GBT, can I use you to come up with a trademarkable company name? And first thing it tells you, conduct a throw trademark search right at the bottom. Consult with a qualified attorney. You know, chat GBT itself knows that there are limitations here. Um, you know, that's, <laughs> that's, that's music to my ears when it says that kind of stuff. Um, I thought it was pretty funny that it it said that itself. Um, so yeah, trademarks, especially, you know, you're not going to have the same issue with copyrights and patents where, you know, and you an AI can come up with an image that is trade perfectly trademarkable, but the kind of, uh, you know, the risk is that you're going to wind up infringing on someone else's trademark when you use it to do that kind of thing. So, you know, use your head, use it to kind of start up with an idea. Like I showed you, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't do words very well. I asked it for a shoe company called Shoe La La, and it this, this is the gibberish it spits out at you. You know, it doesn't do words very well. Images, it's better. So, you know, if you have an idea, you like the look of the shoe design that it gives you, then take that, edit it a little bit, and then put your own your own name on it yourself. You know, add your own kind of human element to it. That's really the safest way to go about it. And always do a trademark search <laughs> uh, to double check uh, that you are not infringing on anything. Um, yeah, I mean, if you guys, you, David and James, do you have any input? If anyone has, uh, has something well, there's, they, yeah, well, Stephen, there's actually, there's an interesting question, um, yeah. uh, from Paul Rea. He says, if you ask the AI to generate a logo of water pipe over wavy graphic of water inside a red circle, is that any different than asking a graphical art, a graphic artist to make that and owning the logo? Um, you know, I, it, that's interesting, Paul, because like, you know, mo one of the number one problems we see um, when it comes to the startup journey, if you will, um, forget put, putting AI aside, but more, more having to do with the graphic artists is that when people go and ask graphic artists to create a logo for them, you're right, that graphic artist might be going on ChatGPT. They might have this wealth of, you know, artistic ability and prior references that they're creating. But most of the time, um, the graphic artist is not being hired under what's called a work made for hire. And as a result, the company that thought that they were owning the logo that the graphic artist came up with actually in law, in copyright law, they don't actually own the copyright because they're not there is not a work made for hire that actually transfers it to you and so 
that being said, with ChatGPT, there's no work made for hire, right? There's no, I mean, maybe there's a terms and conditions that maybe Bing asks you to, we probably should look at that, that Bing asks you to sign, but there is no, like, be, be, because, be, because, Chat GPT or, or or OpenAI is not is not a human being. They even lack the understanding, right? The AI doesn't understand that the that any sort of intellectual property rights, i.e., the copyright, is not being transferred to you just because you asked for it to create a specific image. As opposed to when you're working with a graphical artist, you want them to sign a work made for hire so that they understand, right? As a human being, they understand that any rights that they have to that image is literally being transferred to you as the owner of that image. That's a huge difference. That's right? a really cool interpretation of, 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 of the legal aspect to, uh, to my question. Um, actually, that's yeah. really cool. Thank you. You're welcome, Paul. Um, but Can I ask uh, a quick question? Yeah, of course. Go for Alonzo. This is very interesting, um, but just a quick question. When you ask them to create AI, to create an image, it creates that image based on something that's already out there. And so inevitably it's taking someone's idea in some way. Yes. Good yeah. point, Alonzo. Yeah. Stephen, please, you should, yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, yeah, that's pretty much, you know, that's, that's the idea. They are definitely doing that in some way. It is, it is using that, you know, when I, when I ask for internet company logo, it knows it knows to give you kind of like a globe like logo because there are internet companies out there that use that as the logo. Wow. Um, you know, that's all AI. All AI is doing is taking information and synthesizing it to come up with an answer to what you asked. Wow. Um, and so all that information has to come from somewhere, and it is probably someone's protected work. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, there's a lot of pitfalls you could fall into when you're doing this kind of stuff. And yeah. that's uh, that was that whole Authors Guild lawsuit. They said AI is being trained on our books. We sh we deserve to be licensed uh, licensed for that. Now um, you also mentioned that fair use would be used as a defense. I have like a YouTube channel I just started, and I know that I've always put the fair use stuff on there, mm -hmm. uh, like the fair use language. And I did a little research in it, but it's kind of like a squishy law. There's there's a lot of um, now it's like a balancing test, but it's really yeah. not too too clear how how do you feel that would be as a successful defense do you do you think that would be a successful defense or would be kind of like a case by case basis mm -hmm. that's a really good question it normally yeah. is a case, it normally is a case by case basis there are four factors that the supreme court came up with and you know it depends on how much of the work is being used how the work is being how the work is being used um, it, it depends on whether you're deriving some sort of commercial benefit from it. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot. There's a lot of different factors. So it's never. There's. I, th I think. I think James kind of touched on that a little bit before. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, there yeah. is no bright line test here, and so yeah. you know, usually in the world of copyright, right, when we're talking about artistic and creations, you know, um, everybody thinks they're original, right, and so. Er Everybody thinks that what they created was original, even what they created under ChatGPT, let's say. But in the end, the, the 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 battle between whether you were original or not, and and it is going to come down to a court of law, right? That there's unless you can work it out, right? It's 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 different with patents and trademarks. You file it, it's examined, and it's awarded to you. With a copyright, you're just registering it, and if somebody happens to have something similar, again, who may have made something similar because they maybe used your the, what was what was available on the internet for chat gpt or ai or, or bing to kind of pull it to kind of create their original work and then they go to try to protect it there's going to be a fight against those yeah. two as, as to who was the original creator and that fight only happens in a court of law and so fair use is part and so fair use is your defense there but you know, can it really be a defense based on some of the facts that we were talking about? So yeah, it's a complicated subject yeah. matter for sure. I think uh, the last time the Supreme Court touched fair use in terms of the internet was a really interesting case about Google Images. And the question was, um, is Google Images violating copyright law when it reproduces images on the web search because uh, it's taking those images from somewhere um, and reproducing them when you are searching for them um, and the Supreme Court kind of erred on the side of Google Images. Um, I, I think a lot of people think that it was kind of doing it to just err on the side of 
of business development and kind of tech development and the economy versus what is what might have been letter of the law. Um, and so it's really interesting to see, are they going to do the same thing as they did? That was like, I don't remember exactly. It was, it was years ago, obviously, when Google Images was first starting out. So the yeah. court looks very different than it did back then. Um, what is it? Uh, is it going to be different? Are they still going to err on the side of, you know, business development, AI, tech development, or, or what? You know, it's an interesting question that we don't really have the answer to yet. But what and is one it? of them is one of the main, I guess, public policy uh, points to this is that they don't want to unduly restrict like entrepreneurship, unduly restrict yeah. businesses' ability to, and that's a big like balancing point. Yeah. I mean, the whole point of copyrights in the first place in the Constitution is uh, is for the progress of the arts and sciences. So, you know, is uh, if that is if that is the end goal, what is what is really the best way to get there? It's hard to say. Excellent point. Yeah. All right, Excellent thank you so point. much. Um, I want I want to talk about before we talk about the good. Let's talk about a little bit more of the ugly of of AI, James. I want to go back to James to let you know that. You know, uh, kind of what went down recently in a court of in in a in a in a state court of law. I think it was state. No, it was a federal court of law. It is federal, uh, yes. Right. What's that? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, what maybe will you know kind of contribute to the bad rap that sometimes lawyers get. But uh, James, maybe you can talk about it. Um, you know, kind of what happened. Yeah, and, and it goes to the point that um, I think we've brought up before that is, you know, understand what these tools are, understand how they work, and understand what their limitations are. And, and regardless of what you get, fact-checking, you know, is important, right? Um, and, and so to David's point, <clears throat> you know, this was fairly well publicized in, in, in many circles and, and even hit the mainstream media a little bit, so some may be familiar. But there was a, a case um, back, you know, around uh, earlier 2023 and, and into this summer really was was kind of the finality of it in, in the Southern District of New York. So it is it is in federal court, you know, on top of everything, which it's, it's not good to have issues in any court, but federal court, you should probably try to try to minimize those issues. Uh, but the short of it was that this individual was injured on the job, suing the employer as a result of the injuries, and the employer made a motion to dismiss the claim against them, which means in non-legal speak, they just wanted the lawsuit thrown out. Um, the you know plaintiff's attorneys submitted a brief in opposition to the motion to convince the court why the uh, why the case should not be you know dismissed and why it should move forward. And in doing so, their attorneys, you know, queried specifically ChatGPT uh, for case law uh, as it relates to um, the what they call the Montreal Convention. Now, I can't claim to know a lot about what that is, and I don't really want to get into it here. But suffice to say that that's what they did. Um, and once they submitted it, the other side, you know, submitted their brief, and they kind of said, "Well, okay, plaintiffs." plaintiff cites to a lot of cases here, but we've been unable to, to locate most of them. And the few that they can find don't stand for the proposition for which they're cited. You know, so that in and of itself somewhat implied that perhaps certain cases, you know, in the brief were, were non-existent. And ultimately what happened is that ChatGPT created out of thin air a number of case citations and case law re related to those, you know, citations. Uh, the cases didn't exist where they supposedly were, whether it was a federal reporter or, or Westlaw databases, they weren't there. Um, the Sometimes the citations themselves were accurate, but the case titles were, were different and didn't relate to the subject matter uh, for which it stood for. And even further, and perhaps, you know, to me, I don't, I don't know that I necessarily call it crazy, but again, it, it shows a limitation of the system in terms of the system doesn't think it, it, it operates off of what it's trained off of. When the attorneys went back after getting kind of slapped around by the court a little bit, 
they went back throughout this proceeding and they said, well, they queried Chachi, are these real cases that you've given me? And they said, and it said, yes, they're real cases. They're in Westlaw, they're in Lexis, they're in the federal reporter. These are, these are real cases. And, you know, all of these documents were, were produced as, as part of this. And ultimately, what ended up happening to the attorneys is, is they were sanctioned by the court. Um, if you're unaware of what that means, you got punished by the court. And it's not good. Um, as part of their penalty, uh, they were found liable to have to, to pay $5,000. Uh, they also had to send first class mailed letters to each of the judges that were falsely identified as the author of fake opinions and attach the order in the transcript, um, basically apology letters. And ultimately the case was you know, dismissed um, as well. Um, and so, like I say, the, the sheer fact that it, it, it created false information out of the information that it pulled from uh, again, shows the the lack of you know human thought at the end of the day. Um, it's only as smart as the material it's trained on. It's only as smart as the people that have programmed it. And so there are very real limitations uh, to it. But but we highlight that. And and for anyone who's who's interested or or wants to read the um, you know the court uh documents and the ultimate opinion and order on sanctions uh the, the case is roberto mata uh, v avianca inc I, I can put it into the chat um but they're publicly available documents you, you know and so you can really see because they do go through all of the back and forth they have in exhibits you know what was prompted into jet gpt they have in exhibits um, all of the information, and um, it, it's really eye-opening at the end of the day um, to, to really see how how things can can go awry. And you know, one kind of just side note is that um, if you ever if and this isn't legal advice, this is just general advice. If you ever if you ever screw up and get caught just just come clean because part of their problem was they refused to come clean and they basically doubled down and, and the judge blew a gasket so uh, they probably wouldn't have been sanctioned had it had they just said oh gee i didn't realize how this operated i i, I totally messed up you know if they had done that they probably could have avoided sanctions but it still wouldn't remove the fact that uh chat gpt created fake court cases and fake opinions so wow <laughs> yeah uh, everybody should yeah, please share that in the in the please share the link if you can, or at least the captions that people can Google. Um, there is if by the way, if anyone has a question and they want to ask it live, please raise your hand. Nina Nichelle has a question. Um, I'm gonna let Steven take it. Maybe you can give some background on on the question for those yeah. who don't know. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so she asked, will Thaler, or maybe it's taller, I'm not sure, be V Perlmutter be the blueprint on how AI will be used, how will this grow? So for those of you who don't know, Taller or Thaler, again, I don't know, V. Perlmutter um, is this case in federal court where this guy Thaler, I'm going to say Thaler, Thaler uh, kind of used an AI to both generate drawings and he also did it separately. He used it to create some kind of software program. And so he both tried to make those drawings and that software program uh, he tried to copyright the drawings and tried to patent the software. Um, and so there are two separate cases, actually. Uh, both both cases, both federal court cases where the court had to decide, is this copyrightable or is this patentable? Um, and this is kind of where we got some of our first answers from, uh, which were no. Uh, <laughs> it's not copyrightable. It's not patentable. You need a human author. You need a human inventor. Um, and I mean, those were federal cases in district courts. I think Perlmutter was DC, District of DC. So obviously it doesn't go all the way up to the Supreme Court. They haven't answered that question. Uh, but I, we probably doubt that it's really gonna go further than that. The Copyright Office has kind of taken that same stance. Um, you know, AI cannot be, AI cannot be the author or the inventor of a copyright or a patent. It, it just, uh, it isn't the case you need human authorship or human inventorship to kind of add add to that. Um, 
And that's probably probably where we're going to be for a little while, at least, unless Congress steps in and changes something. Uh, that's probably uh, that's probably what it's going to be, what it's going to be like in copyrights and patents. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see what the developers of AI are going to, how, how much are they going to push back on this? Maybe not yet. Like how much is Google and Bing, right? Those massive big companies, how much are they going to push back and be like, what do you mean? We got all these programmers that are creating human beings that are creating these AI uh, softwares. So there is some element of human intervention. I, I mean, I think that's where we're headed. That, they, that conversation is going to have to happen uh, sooner or later in, 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 in a court of law and, and or Congress. Um, any uh, questions um, before we turn to some of the good? Yes, Peter, go for it. Yeah, so I had a question whether you could use AI to create a persona around someone that you can monetize. Hey, I want to create a Johnny Cochran, you know, lawyer. I've fed in all of his cases and content. You can now ask it questions and it'll respond actually like it's Johnny Cochran raised from the dead. Like, wow. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm using him as an example or, you know, yeah. Snoop Dogg or Beyonce. Like, can you use anyone's pers anyone's content in that way? Create an AI assistant that represents them or represents like a a a, a book or a comedian, you know. Yeah, what do you th I mean, James, I have some thoughts, Stephen, I have some thoughts. What do you think? You want to want to go first maybe? Want to take a try to crack at it? Um, well, I mean, it's always the legal answer, right? I mean, can can you? you yes, you know, should you? <laughs> uh how how much trouble do you want to have? Hand, <laughs> right? You know, rest assured whether whether legally speaking you were in the right or in the wrong, uh, would, the, would Beyonce's uh, attorneys and entire legal department uh, be right up on you that, over something like that? Copyright. I, I, I'm I'm absolutely sure that they that they would, right? Yeah. Um, so legally speaking, that that brings in um, a, a whole host of of other issues regarding you know publicity rights, uh, regarding likeness. And um, you know you're, you're you're probably going to find yourself running afoul of um, you know certain things, but at the end of the day, you know as with most of these things, what ends up happening is that uh, you, you never make it through to see you know a court decision. Uh, you know it would settle you know somewhere okay. along. So, along. so your advice would be to partner with those people and get some kind of licensing rights to create those kinds of materials. Right, exactly. I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, I mean, that's that's the route that you would want to take, because, like I say, wh whether whether you're right or not, depending on exactly what you do and how you do it, rest assured that uh, once someone finds out, you know, if it's been done without their permission, they, they will come after you. Yeah, and, yeah. and Richard, and Richard's and pointing out in the comments how Meta just announced they're doing <laughs> chatbots with personalities. I assume they licensed it from those people. Yeah, I mean, Peter. Yeah. Like, so, so, so basically, to, to James's point, whether you're alive or dead, you or your estate is your, owns your right the, the the rights to your name, likeness, voice, persona, everything. So, yeah, I probably I would bet that Meta and Facebook, being who they are hopefully they're doing the right thing that they have, they have the license from the estates or the people, or it's some, you know, strategic partnership to make everybody money, which is likely the case. But, to, but yeah, if you, if you want to use Johnny Cochran, you, you need to talk to Johnny Cochran's estate first, right? If you can, like James said, you can do whatever you want. Right. But like you can, but at the end of the day, you probably want, you want to get their permission, especially if you're going to do well, let's face it. Most of the people, like some, sometimes people do these things and it doesn't go anywhere. Oh, okay, but like if you really want to make a big bang and a big splash with your idea, and which means that your all eyes are going to be on you, then you better have your ducks in order, you know. And and I see that Alan put in uh, the chat yeah. about a clear violation of California law, which is which is a good point. I mean, California has probably the, if not you know, but probably the most you know kind of restrictive laws on this uh, side of thing, you know, throughout the country. Perhaps unsurprisingly, you know, L.A. Right. I mean, yep. uh, Hollywood, you know, I mean, certainly. But um, but yeah, I mean, to Alan's point, I mean, Alan's correct. And, and, and you know, to Richard's comment and, and what David said, um, I don't know personally what 
what Meta or Facebook did in, in, in this collaboration or, or relationship. But I would be willing to bet, you know, quite a bit that um, that they have, you know, permission and, and written agreement for, for the same. Um, yeah. I would be shocked if they did not, because again, it just that's just not something that would would, would happen at that level. Yeah. Unless you want to see Facebook on the hill again, that's not that that's <laughs> pretty, pretty common occurrence. Nina, question. Um, I just wanted to comment on that and correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is of May first, 2021, you can't utilize anybody that's passed um after that. You can't utilize their imaging. Prior to that, they're still in litigation to try and protect that. But at the moment, it is anybody um that's passed away after May 1st, 2021 you need their estate and their permission to utilize their imaging at any aspect. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that would be correct. Yeah. Yeah, just ask permission, right? I mean, that's what it's all about. Just ask, that's the moral of this story, right? Ask permission when you want to use other people's things. And if you're getting it created by ChatGPT, you're probably going to have to ask some permission eventually somewhere from someone. And so be careful. Let's talk about some of the good and we have some good examples. I mean, we talked about some of them just in, 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 in final, in, in closing, James, yeah. maybe first, Stephen, you, you second, maybe some, you know, good utilizations of, uh, of uh, uh, AI. Yeah, well, I mean, for one, I mean, you know, AI is intellectual property at its heart, right? It is protectable. I mean, it's an invention in and of itself. But, and so, you know, to the extent that you can, you know, utilize that in, in some novel, non-obvious way, I mean, it, it is protectable. If you develop your own, um, you know, chatbot or whatever it is, you know, the name of it is is trademarkable. So there's, there's a lot that goes with it. So there, there's good pieces there. And, you know, that spins right into, you know, the types of things that, that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, which is inventions implementing, you know, AI right? Machine learning. Um, I can think of one instance and then we have, you know, a client and clients with, you know, patents that have issued. Um, so no confidentiality is being broken here, issued patents. Um, but it has to do with, with AI examination of, of medical images in terms of improved and enhanced uh, diagnosis. Um, and, and, you know, particularly when you're thinking about you know, the timeframes of being able to catch and detect cancer uh, off, you know, off, off medical images, uh, timing can be paramount, depending on the type of, uh, you know, affliction that you're talking about. And, um, you know, the sooner you can detect things like that, the better. And so that's something that um, is, a, is a definite advantage in, in the AI landscape that's, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's a firsthand experience dealing with it as being the patent attorney who helps to, you know, protect that sort of thing. So, you know, I don't want you to take anything that I've, you know, said today in the wrong way that it's, it's, it's all doom and gloom, right? We want to highlight some examples so that people can understand, again, how things work, you know, what they do do and, and, and what their limitations are, you know, but the upside, uh, you know, it, it sees no limit as far as I'm concerned at this point. Um, and so, you know, that that's just one example. I mean, I could go on, but um, I'll let I'll let David and, and, and Stephen, you know, add a couple in here. Stephen, what do you think? Yeah, the good. I mean, yeah, like kind of like we were saying earlier, it's really it's a really useful tool to start kind of on the ground floor of everything you want to do as like a new business owner, if you need a new name, ask the AI, it can give you 50, 50 ideas for names. And, you know, maybe you don't want to use exactly one, but you can, you can really get a good jump start there. If you need a logo, maybe you don't want to pay a graphic designer. You can get, you can get a logo that is potentially trademarkable uh, and you could edit it a little bit here and there. You don't have to use the exact one. You could get kind of an image that you like, slap your name on there in a nice font. And, you know, that could be trademarkable. Uh, and that's, you know, it's really, it's really a useful tool for someone that is starting out a business that has an idea for artists. If you want to, if you have like a, an idea for something you want to draw, if you want to use it for something that uh, in your advertising, even, you know, if it's something that you aren't even worried so much about being copyrighted, you just need an image, you know, it is, it is super useful. It is a really great tool um, to use. and 
you know, there are pitfalls like we were talking about, but you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of pros there. Um, and it is really, it's really being democratized. You can, everyone can get it, um, can use it online. Like we showed you chat GPT, the Bing image thing there, there are plenty of others. So, you know, really play around with it and see what you can use it for. People are saying they use it for their bio and their website or, you know, their resume or, or anything like that. Um, and so, you know, you know, be creative. You can, you can use it for a lot of different things um, that you're having trouble with. You know, ask ChatGPT, see what it says. <laughs> ask ChatGPT how to use AI most, uh, most efficiently. You'll see a lot of organizational stuff, uh, administrative stuff. There's a lot of great things that you can use it for. Anybody have any, anybody want to share uh, maybe a, a kind of use of AI that they found uh, pretty, uh, uh, pretty beneficial or, um, I use it to create bedtime stories for the kids that are interactive. I love that, Peter. That's awesome. Right. That's really as long cute. as Peter doesn't now now claim copyright ownership of that. So, <laughs> right. I mean, he can just read those stories right off of chat GPT. Alan, I used to AI to create this video for my book club. Yes, I saw that link. Check that out, everybody. That's uh, pretty fun. Um, so, yeah, uh, we're going to. We're going to uh, uh, close the presentation. I just want to let everybody know that, what is it, create schedules that can be exported to Google Calendar, summarize notes for lectures. Yes, I love all that. Yes, very organizational stuff. That's awesome. Um, yeah, we'll see where this goes. Anyway, we're going to close the presentation. Our next um, uh, entrepreneurial strategy series is October 26th which is the last Thursday of the month. It is at 12 p.m. Eastern, and it's all about trade secrets. Um, we get that a lot. Like, should I patent? Should I trade secret? What do I do? We've never had a formal presentation on trade secrets. We have two amazing female uh, attorneys, one based out of Israel and one based out of Philadelphia. Both of them are trade secret uh, attorneys and litigators. And uh, they're going to really illuminate that topic. So look out for the recap video of this. We'll send, we'll send you the recording. We'll send you a little recap. And then uh, look out for that next uh, ESS that we'll have uh, next month. Anyway, thank you, everybody, for joining. This recording will be up uh, on YouTube as well. Um, if you have any other questions or for me or James or anybody on, on this panel or, 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 or anybody that you heard from today, please let us know. And uh, good luck out there to all of you.